of New Jersey and a two-term president. And what Congress wanted us to do was to bring that academic policy and analytical side of Wilson together with the people who are making and actually influencing policy. He often thought that they were, himself thought that they were engaged in a complementary exercise. So we will do that through having, over the course of a year, 150 people who come to do research here on all sorts of different aspects of public policy. And then we have a, a set of programs that do meetings like this where we bring together people who are doing a lot of thinking uh, on key questions of the day. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we have so often found ourselves enrolling in what I think of as classes on education offered by the Einstein Fellows. Let me say just a word about the Einstein Fellows for those of you here and of course those watching on the web. The Einstein Fellows are outstanding math and science teachers usually from middle or high schools who are picked out to spend a year or sometimes two in Washington working in a science oriented agency including at times in offices or in committees on the Hill. What has struck me uh, about them, and I think this is the third class that I've gotten to know, is that in addition to being outstanding frontline teachers, they have all thought about education as a system, how new ideas develop, how some work, some don't, how they're introduced, questions of professional development, questions of how uh, successful innovations do or do not spread widely. It's been just an enormous education for us. Uh, today, we are asking them to take a look at the business role in education. Some of you may have noticed that part of President Obama's overall push to educate to innovate has led to a new organization called Change the Equation, in which a hundred CEOs have signed up to really make a push on education, including, of course, STEM education, which the latter being a particular priority of the president. Business in the past has played an important role, active role in education. If you go back to uh, President H.W. Bush, George H.W. Bush, he held the third only ever summit with all the governors. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt did it first on conservation, Franklin Roosevelt on the Great Depression, and President Bush, 41, did it on education. And he worked uh, closely with a, a, the gubernatorial representative who was at the time a then obscure governor of Arkansas who went on to considerably greater things and continued and really built on the, uh, some of the initiatives that President Bush had started. At that time, the Business Roundtable, which is made up of CEOs of some of many of the largest companies in the United States, assigned two CEOs to work with each governor. Uh, so there has been this periodic involvement of the business community, and at a local level, sometimes a state level, businesses have often been, uh, been involved uh, for many, and I think maybe for all, in addition to being concerned about the country, being, con being involved in education is perhaps one of the best forms of enlightened self-interest, uh, because the people here on the panel are really training the next generation of engineers, the next generation of technical workers, the next generation really of citizens who are going to help move the country forward. Well, to discuss this important question, we have an outstanding panel of Einstein fellows, and let me introduce them from starting from your left and, and my right. Uh, Brenda Garduna uh, is from Idaho. I'm a country boy from Oregon, so I always appreciate a little Northwestern uh, representation here. She uh, has a BS from Boise State University, which has gotten quite a bit of notoriety, not for science in this case, for but football. for football. <laughs> and uh, she also has a master's degree in uh, curriculum instruction. She teaches uh, in alternative high school programs in Idaho, and I think it would be interesting to learn a little more about that as we go forward. And then to my immediate right uh, is Arundhati Jayarao. Have I got that right? I always get the Arundhati okay. <laughs> She has a BF in math, physics, and chemistry, uh, master's in physics. 
She is uh, actually a, a longtime experienced physicist and now teaches at a girls' school in northern Virginia. Uh, she's a second-year fellow in Senator uh, Gillibrand's, Gillibrand's office. And to my left, your right, is John Moore. Uh, he's a specialist in environmental science from the great state of uh, New Jersey. Has an interesting background with the BS in urban planning as well as environmental science. Uh, he has uh, taught at the Burlington Institute of Technology, and I know he will bring an interesting perspective of a, of a school that is not that really does have an eye, I would say, on the workforce in the more immediate sense than some others do. And uh, he has, in addition to many other things, lectured around the world. Welcome Sue Witsit, who is from the great state of Wisconsin, just going through some very tumultuous times with regard to education right now. Uh, she has a BS in science education and um, another degree in curriculum from the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. She's taught science for, I would guess, 25 years. Sue, is that about right? Maybe going on 30 years. And uh, has used all sorts of different techniques in the classroom. Well, we have given the Einstein Fellows a number of the, the questions that occurred to us with regard to business involvement, but I'd like to call on each of them just to make an opening statement, and then maybe we can go question by question. Um, I'll do the easiest possible thing and start alphabetically. Brenda, the floor is yours. Right. Um, again, my name's Brenda Gardunia, and um, I have 20 years' experience teaching at-risk students, as Kent said, um, at risk of dropping out of high school. And I'm in mostly, I'm in Boise, Idaho, so that's as, about as urban as you can get in Idaho. Um, and I wanted to briefly explain maybe one model of industry business partnership that's working in my school district. And um, it's called the Professional Technical Center and it um, serves three neighboring districts that share this. And some of the key components that uh, make this so successful are one, each student has to come in with a, and they form an educational plan. Um, two, the focus is to prepare students for transition to post-secondary training and careers. Um, the business and industrial partnerships are a real vital link. College credit is a key feature. And then there are competitive paid internships for all the 11th and 12th graders in the program. Some examples of some of the courses they offer are um, automotive collision repair, commercial graphic design, um, many construction trades, health professions, uh, welding courses. Um, for an example, of what the students do during this is that in the construction trade courses each year the students build a green home um, with as many of the latest uh, conservation ideas that they can and then after they are completed the building of this home then it, it's put up for sale. We must realize that not all students are going to go to an academic college. But all students need an opportunity to, for some type of post-high school career training. So coming from a more rural western state, working with poverty and at-risk students, I'm hoping that I can bring maybe a slightly different perspective to this conversation. Um, the President's Council of Advisors on School and Tech, on, uh, Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, or the PCAST report, said that we needed to not only prepare students, but that we must also inspire students. And as a teacher, I try really hard to, ins to prepare my students. But to inspire them, I need to reach outside of my classroom and enlist the help of my community. And I see that industry and business can be a very important part of that. Um, anytime you have a partnership, it needs to benefit both partners. And sometimes I think it has been in the past that they, it has been thought that a 
partnership with a business or an industry meant that they gave a lot of money and the schools benefited by receiving money. Um, but there's much more to that. And my way of thinking that there are benefits to the school, yes, often it is a monetary benefit or supplies and equipment or expertise and experience that they can gain from industry, real world experiences for their students, and the building and connections for students of relationships outside of school. But there's also a big benefit to the business and the industry. They have an increased pool of well-prepared workforce. Um, they have improved public relations. It strengthens the communities in which they reside. And it has opportunities for them to give back to the community. So to make a significant difference for an at-risk student, preparation and inspiration are equally important. And it must come at a very personal level not just from a textbook or a report, but from a person. My st students need to know that someone cares and someone's willing to take a chance with them. We're not only trying to educate children, we're trying to change attitudes, we're giving hope, and we're building dreams. So it takes a whole village, and I see that business and industry is an important part of that village. Thank you. Before we go to Arundhati, I wanted to introduce one of our very special guests, uh, former Congressman Ralph Regula. Ralph, if you raise your hand, there you are, uh, who has, <laughs> he asked me not to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. He's really been an enormous champion for education, and it was only a couple of years ago that I learned that he had actually been a school teacher and a school principal before becoming a, a political leader and has continued to focus on education in his many, many years of representing Ohio in the House of Representatives. Arundhati. Um, thank you, Kent. Thank you always for the opportunity you provide to the Einstein Fellows. And I can't tell you what an honor it is to come and serve on this panel and to sit with my illustrious colleagues here. You can tell she's been working in the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> and the next statement I'm going to make is that whatever I say today is my own personal views and has nothing to do with the Senate. Um, <laughs> so uh, I approach, well, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, Kent has already introduced me. Uh, I come from, uh, with all my degrees from India, and I worked as a physicist in a federal research lab I also worked for a couple of years in the IT industry, uh, where also I have seen uh, youngsters come in and participate in business. And, uh, and then I moved on to education. My, my stint with education, although formerly I've been a teacher for seven years in a private girls' school, I've been involved with education and teaching informally, teaching and um, contributing to the schools via the PTA for more than 15 years um, as my children's parent. And a lot of my business with K-12 partnership experience comes with the perspective of the PTA and the role that the PTAs have to play in terms of building up these partnerships um, and the important role that they do play. And, uh, I would also like to look at uh, the fact that I'm coming from Fairfax County Schools. I taught in a private school in Virginia. And Fairfax County Schools is the 12th largest school system with a budget totaling $2.2 billion. Um, and um, it operates 230 fac facilities, over 25 million square feet of space, and more than 131,000 of our students ride more than 18.2 mile, million miles each year on 1,512 buses. Um, and <laughs> yes, I got some statistics. For the budget, 73.8% um, of FCPS budget is funded by the Fairfax County, and it receives only 19% of the budget from the state, all because of the way that it is structured and we get a benefit from the real estate taxes and the county contributions. Uh, Fairfax County schools depend a lot on businesses for uh, a lot of their uh, 
lot of their equipment, a lot of their partnerships, a lot of the way the students are uh, given opportunities. And working in a private school, I have had to uh, reach out to businesses, to agencies, to science um, agencies, to, uh, to help my students uh, get involved with uh, scientific careers. My focus as a teacher has always been to promote a passion in sci of science in students not necessarily to make them go into PhD careers, but to make them understand the relevancy of science and technology in the real world. And that is something which has made me uh, start projects which involve uh, alternative kind of assessments, which involve, again, business partnerships. So I have been involved with uh, having uh, projects which involve aerospace industries, uh, projects which involve the American Chemical Society, projects which involve um, NSTA's uh, uh, Explorer Vision competition, which, is, which has a big uh, business component, which is the Toshiba. And uh, our school has been uh, happy to have been from all those projects uh, by participation from my school, a team of students who went on to get uh, equipment for the school because of their participation and open doors for internships and uh, other things. As a parent, uh, I have seen this value um, in one of the uh, premier science and technology schools of our nation. Uh, I've been fortunate for my kids to have gone to Thomas Jefferson and uh, I've seen the strong focus that the TJ has on business partnerships, which is entirely run by a committee which is uh, um, which has as its members parents alumni business partnerships uh, business corporations and the principal and it's very important to understand the principal uh, principal's uh, role in this business partnerships and I would like to address that a little bit and uh, I'd like to talk about how the TJ partnership fund has helped TJ remain competitive and how all the budget issues affect the schools to look to business partnerships. Thank you, Arundhati. John? Yes, good morning. Um, I would like to bring to the table um, uh, the career technical education model. I've spent about 30 years now. I taught at the, uh, the Career Technical Institute in New Jersey, as Kent uh, said in my introductions. And so we have a, a business uh, education partnership already in place. There already exists a national infrastructure throughout all 50 states here in the United States, but there are also you know, partnerships and models all throughout the world. Almost every country has some type of uh, career technical um, track. Some of the uh, highlights that, uh, that we can bring right up front here is that it focuses specifically on workforce development. So it's a different type of model. It's in... Um, I refer to often as the higher education model is what most uh, academic schools focus on. The goal is to move people into uh, colleges or university where uh, CTE, career technical education model, is uh, doesn't prohibit students moving in that direction but provides an alternate route, meaning moving directly into the workforce. Um, it is a business-driven model. Standards support uh, the business-driven model. How my program was uh, designed is I operated an advisory council. Um, each program in the school that I taught in, the school that I taught in is very typical of many vocational technical schools. Um, you have those business partners who look over the skills, the equipment, and kind of um, work on the curriculum development. When the standards came out, we married them. Of course, I taught in a, in a science technology um, program, environmental science, which ended up being geospatial technology. So it was very academically oriented. Uh, one of the other things that that type of model um, provides is it appeals to a different type of learner. Um, it's pretty successful in reaching underrepresented uh, populations. Uh, because of its design structure, it has opportunities to do things that we're talking about now, like project-based learning or hands-on, minds-on activities, um, to engage in real-life experiences because the structure of the school day provides the, quote, luxury of time to instructors and teachers that most um, schools, traditional schools, do not have. Um, 
<clears throat> most of the time, too, one of the differences in this partnership is most of the career major teachers or instructors come directly out of the business community. Therefore, as it was, I worked for county government for two years before I came to be a teacher, so I'm an alternate route teacher, uh, that we had direct experience in the field and also drag into the classroom all of our business contacts. So that kind of fits into um, you know, creating this pipeline for students so that uh, the students are not only provided with the skills and hands-on activities, but I was able to mentor people into the business community because I already knew what my colleagues from the business world were doing, and it's kind of a nice handshake or handoff in, into those fields. So just as an opening statement, I just want you to start thinking about that because there's a, a, you know, a lot more information that can be um, fleshed out from those from that framework. Thank you, John. Sue? Good morning, Kent. I would also like to take the opportunity to say thank you for hosting these forums and allowing the Einstein Fellows to come and be part of them. I think I can speak on behalf of the Einstein Fellowship that this has been some of the highlights for us to be able to come and speak with people in the community about our passion for education. So thank you. Thank you. I am from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, where I teach in what's the largest high school in the state of Wisconsin, both in area and in the population. The community of Fond du Lac has 42,000 people. Our high school has approximately 2,200 students and 150 staff. Our school district is made up of 13 schools, one high school, three middle schools, nine elementary schools. And it's a different area to work in. We have a lot of large companies in Fond du Lac that are known worldwide. If any of you do boating or fishing, you probably have heard of Mercury Marine. Mercury Marine took their business out of Stillwater, Oklahoma two years ago and moved it back to Fond du Lac to make it one of the world leaders in manufacturing of boats and motors. This has had a large impact on our community. And I'll be talking a little bit more about the partnership that Mercury Marine has with our community and what it means to have a worldwide corporation in a very small community itself. Partnerships, with edu or partnerships in education are important for our students. When you have the partnership with businesses, as everyone said before, these are the pipeline for those businesses in the future but you have to have programs to help the students understand what those businesses are. Personally, I've been involved in four different activities or in my district that I'd like to discuss with you today. In 2001, I was a recipient of a large grant from the Toyota Corporation in conjunction with the National Science Teacher Association. The grant was for $10,000. It allowed me to have a direct impact on my students in getting them to be able to do hands-on research on the ponds that had been built at our new high school. Wisconsin passed a rule that if you have any new building of so many square feet, you have to have retention ponds we had to build four retention ponds. And somebody came up with the idea that if we put geothermal heat exchange systems in the bottom of these ponds, we'd be able to heat and cool our school. With the grant, I was, be able, I was able to purchase equipment for my students to use that would never have been possible with the budget that our school district had. Our students went out and did research to find out what would be the impact of the geothermal heat exchange loop systems on the ecology of the ponds. That began in 2001. The teachers in my building today are still doing that research. That's direct on students. They not only understand what's happening ecologically with the system, but because of the grant from a large corporation, they have the equipment to do it. But besides that, the corporation that put the geothermal heat exchange systems in the pond, AF A.J. Ahern have, de have given the school a model of the heat exchange pumps that are used so that we can also teach about the science behind geothermal energy. Again, without these business partnerships, we wouldn't have been able to do that with our students. But that's also leveraged some other grants. Now, in a school, in a community of 42,000, and you've definitely heard in the news about Wisconsin and the education, the budget problems, we need some money to help teach. Last year, one of the teachers who's continued working on the pond research 
was able to use that grant as a leverage for a $47,000 grant from State Farm Insurance. So once you get some grants from and partnerships, you can use those to get more, and that's been important in our school. At my high school, we have a construction career, construction career academy that is sponsored by 25 construction companies from around the city. We have three major construction companies in Fond du Lac, and they partnered with others from up to 100 miles away to put in place this construction academy with the idea that they are building the pipeline for construction workers in the future. And I'll address that a little bit later in my comments. <coughs> Another program that our school has is a school to work program that's sponsored by the Association of Commerce. Currently, keep in mind, we have 2,200 students in our school. We have 20 students who are in this program that do apprenticeships throughout the community. Last, Mercury Marine sees the need for the future pipeline of skilled workers at all levels in their company. With that, they are in partnership right now, and we hope to start next year a STEM charter school for grades three through five. This is going to be sponsored by Mercury Marine. The governor's board for this charter school is going to be made up of other people in the community representing our two-year university campus that's in Fond du Lac, the technical college that's in Fond du Lac. On the governor's board, there will be representatives from one of the banks in Fond du Lac, and parents will also be on this governor's board so that they can work together to provide a unique school that's going to be a public school in our district to help students in the STEM fields. Partnerships are important, and without them, I don't think some of the schools could exist, especially in this climate of change with budget cuts. And I hope that today we can address some of the questions that you have about what actually happens in the schools when businesses come in. Thank you, Sue. Let me just ask two questions before we turn to this educated audience here. Uh, it, in different ways, I think all of you emphasized what Brenda started with, which was not only preparation but inspiration. And part of that inspiration came with real world, ex real world experience. I know I'm, I'm always thinking back to my high school algebra days where the river's going at three miles an hour and you're rowing at five miles an hour and how long to get to London or whatever. And it seemed very abstract as opposed to going out and actually using scientific reasoning and tools to find out what's happening in a particular, uh, a particular pond or going to a business where you get a sense of, oh, I see how that's applied and how critical it is in the future of the world uh, around us. Is that essentially right, that that exposure to business that is a practical application, not just business, but a practical application of the science and math is a, an important aspect of inspiration? Is that, is that do I, did I hear that? An immense correctly? part, especially with my students, because so many of them come um, from <clears throat> homes where they aren't exposed to different opportunities, different kind of careers, different things in the world. They're <laughs> very limited on what they've seen of the world. And um, how can they aspire to be things if they don't even know they exist and so they need to see what there is out there the things that they can do and the differences they can make now what Arundhati you teach at a really top girls school and then you're exposed to TJ Thomas Jefferson which was the first high school in the country to have its own supercomputer this is not your average mm -hmm. totally not like the high school I went to do, do you see the same gains there as they see a practical application of what they're studying? Absolutely. Um, as you know, the TJ diploma involves um, a requirement of a senior thesis, a senior thesis in the, um, in the 12th grade. So this, all students are required to do that. They could either participate in the 13 technology and science labs that they have in the school campus, or they could go through the mentorship program. and. Uh, the technology labs, again, they have some of the best equipment that any school can hope to have, and they couldn't have, it couldn't have been possible without uh, business contributions. Absolutely. There is no way that TJ could have survived. It was started as a private 
public partnership um, 25 years ago. And, uh, and as it's now close to 50 years since it had its la last renovation. Uh, so th there is no money from the county coming, uh, there is no, and it's a governor's school, so the way the funding works for TJ is a little different. It has to depend a lot on businesses to be able to give the students the kind of uh, academic curriculum which it, it wants to give, and it is modeled to give. It's the mission of that school to give. So uh, it has, um, I can read out a list of the par business partnerships, but I definitely know that there's Lockheed Martin, Orbital Sciences, Aerospace Industries, uh, and uh, um, uh, of Grumman, all these industries, and plus more, uh, I don't have the entire list with me, but they have contributed to each of those labs, particular mm -hmm. equipment, and they make sure that the students are able to perform their senior res uh, research thesis in those labs. And uh, the mentorship opportunity, which is op offered to some students, I mean, it's, it's one of those options that the students can take either mentorship or do their senior thesis in their high school uh, itself, uh, implies that the, men the students need to go to some places where businesses and agencies are open to inviting these students. The MITRE uh, Corporation, uh, Carnegie Institute of Washington, uh, NASA, all these have opened up places for uh, positions for these students to go and do mentorship and perform high, uh, pretty high uh, achieving results uh, in research. And, uh, and you can tell from the way, whether it is TJ or the Bronx School in New York or the Sichuan uh, Science Focus Schools or the Illinois Science and Tech Schools, all of them operate, you would realize that when students are involved in such uh, internship and mentorship projects, they produce high class research. And there are some of these Intel winners and Siemens winners, which then provide them the scholarships and admissions into these prestigious colleges. And that's an opportunity for students to go ahead. And without these partnerships, TJ couldn't have provided that kind of uh, world class uh, education to the students. John, your students usually aren't aspiring to go to MIT, the way you described, at least not initially. Do, does that practical experience they get also spark their interest that it's not just a job, but just something I could really enjoy doing that kind of gets me thinking about the job? Yeah, uh, definitely. The, one of the uh, things that I think that um, career technical education answers the question that I think every student has asked throughout eternity is, uh, why do I have to learn this? And anybody that's a teacher in the room, I'm sure you've been asked that thousands of times. Um, that gives us a really good answer, other than, well, there's a test coming, you need it to get through the course, there's a state test coming, or you need it for college. When you're talking to a 13 or 14 year old entering as a freshman in high school, that is a little abstract to, to the types of students that um, you know, I engage with. So when you can point to business and you can go to those careers and say, well, it's, you know, and it takes the heat off of you as a teacher because, it's, well, it's not me that's requiring this of you. You know, you go yourself, talk to these business people, and they will tell you what they expect if you want to go work for them. So they're entering the schools. They've chosen their careers. They've chosen their professions. My job then becomes to not only instruct them in the content, but the pathway of how you go into that profession. So just to give you a quick example, I taught a lot of the students came in, they want to be TV meteorologists. Well, that's a lofty goal. <laughs> now, remember, you're 14 years old. So I said, well, I'm not telling you you can't do that, but, you know, it's a pretty, st you know, tall hill to climb. But let's break that down and see what the pieces are. So I have the experience of working with TV broadcast meteorologists, so I can talk to them. I said, well, you don't have to believe me. You can go talk to her, and she will break down the pathway, how she got that job. She's successful at it. And so then they understand that. So now they have two points of reference. They have me as their instructor, but they have a role model in the field. So then the choice is back in their hand. And one of the things that I believe that the business model has there is you put the choice back into the student. So they take responsibility for their education. Um, they can always opt out and go into a traditional academic high school and work through the required courses and go to college like most of their friends they're doing, and they had to leave their friends to come to a, to a school like mine. So 
Yeah, it definitely works. And then, of course, you have, as uh, Arundhati mentioned, you have different equipment. You know, I'm certainly a recipient of businesses because they want to try it out. They want to see what interests the, the students. Maybe they updating things, particularly on the technology end. The business is right on the cutting edge. You know, schools are like 10 steps be behind that. So you're able, you know, if you can move up to two steps behind that, you're doing really well. So you get some more um, current cutting edge um, access. Mm -hmm. Sue, has your, your pond experiment uh, led people to think differently about then science and engineering? In an indirect way, when we started doing our ponds, they had just been built. And we were watching, collecting data on different aspects of the pond water. And we found a real strange thing happening in the ponds where one of them had this high saline content. And at first, we could not figure out what was causing that until the following winter when we saw them putting so much salt down on the road right next to that one pond because it's also a curve, and one of the cars had kind of gone down into the pond a little when it missed the curve going too fast. So since then, they have decreased the amount of salt they use everywhere in our parking lots, on the roads, and they credit the research that we did because they said we really didn't realize that it was having a harm that it was harming what was going on in the ecosystem they've also put up massive boulders so that if students are going too fast they're going to hit a boulder instead of going into the pond now <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if parents are glad about that but <laughs> <laughs> so some of the research led to some changes in just what we do to our environment and that i think is a great this thing. is a great Washington example of not only seeing how your science led to an answer, but it changed public policy. Although usually some people often accuse us of putting boulders in the way of progress as opposed to uh, in the service of science. Well, let me hold the rest of my questions and please open it up to this educated audience. Uh, who would like to, yes, sir, the gentleman there, Clark, uh, near you, the gentleman. If you could please introduce yourself. Thank you, Jeff Schwartz with the Appalachian Regional Commission. I'm curious, both positive and negative, what have been the most surprising, perhaps unintended consequences of business partnerships for the schools as well as for the businesses? Things that you weren't expecting that did happen. I can start with one. Mercury Marine, as I said, is a large corporation and they were trying to do some commercials. Our school was built in 2000, and it has a state-of-the-art TV production studio. Mercury Marine asked if they could come and do the filming at our high school because they didn't have a production studio themselves. They used our students to help them put together the production, and it gave the students a chance to learn skills that they were going to eventually learn, but it was actually helping a major contributor in our community. So that was a consequence I don't think anyone ever dreamed was going to occur when they put this TV production studio into our high school. Anyone else on the panel? With, about uh, anything business has done that looked good and then maybe had a negative impact or that was just kind of a neutral initiative that had a surprisingly positive impact? Well, I would like to just weigh in with um, some of the after-school programs. Uh, which are conducted in um, a lot of high-need schools. Uh, and I speak to one particular program called the Shakespeare Remix uh, Project, uh, conducted at one of New York's, uh, some of the New York uh, cities in you know, public schools, where, uh, which had a high dropout rate, uh, but they had this after-school business partnership with some of the theater artists there and um, they used to come in and work with the students uh, to participate in uh, in Shakespeare monologues and such theaters and such competitions arts and arts and arts competitions but uh, once the students um, got interested in that and then realized that 
they see themselves down the road, they see some future for themselves, they see a career for themselves in the arts, uh, uh, in the arts industry, in the drama industry, in the theater industry. They realize that they did have to graduate, they had to get some courses, they, need, they realized that they needed to go in certain directions uh, to, um, to ensure that they reach and get their goals. In fact, one of the groups won the national award and came to the White House, met Michelle Obama, and uh, what could be more inspirational than that? Um, so th these kind of partnerships are very vital in uh, revitalizing um, failing <laughs> schools and uh, helping student achievement, uh, especially in uh, low-income areas. So these are really beneficial partnerships in that sense. Uh, well, can I just add one, sure, one quick John. thing? Um, I'll make it brief, but it's a negative that's a positive. And the business community has higher expectations for the students. So they have, they, you know, businesses, as you can imagine, operate in a, in a business corporate world, and that does not waver at all. They know what they need to survive. So they kind of indirectly impose that on our students. So as a teacher, that's a positive thing. But, um, you know, the, the uh, negative for the students is it brings them, brings them up to the business uh, community. So I just wanted to throw that in as kind of a double-sided might be depends on your pers what, what side of the desk you're sitting on, whether it's a positive or a negative. Hi, I'm Kamzi McAdams, and I um, am another Einstein Fellow. And I just wanted to ask two questions that are totally different. So if you don't want to answer one, you can answer the other one. Um, one question is that um, last September there was a big hoopla about um, uh, an initiative from, um, sponsored by the White House called Change the Equation. And it's supposed to have um, business and industry, major business and industry corporate partners, putting a lot of money towards successful programs. Um, myself as a teacher, I have been unable to find any um, teacher-directed input involved in the website. And as a teacher, I don't really know how to get to the successful programs that millions of dollars are supposedly um, funding all over. And I wonder whether any of you have any information on that. And if not, then um, you can talk about my other question, which is that I don't know whether you're familiar with, they're called the big picture schools. Um, uh, and they do basically an all business um, partnership model for their schooling. Kids come in in ninth grade and are put into cohorts and select an internship kind of more similar to what John was talking about, and then they say, well, I'm interested in being a meteorologist. And then the teachers at those schools design an entire four-year program around learning all the aspects of what it takes to become a meteorologist, and then they put them through these business partnerships. And I wonder what you think about that, about a concept where you would take a kid at 14 and say, you know, they're interested in being a neonatal nurse or something, and then you just design their four-year program on that. And I'd just like to hear what you think about that. If I may jump in on that uh, first. Um, Kamsi, that's essentially the model that you described in which my school operates. So we have multiple career majors. But one of the things that we bring to the table, I taught students, the same students, all four years, a half a day. So um, I had them, I didn't hand them off, they spent about two and a half hours a day with me, five days a week, all four years, grades nine through 12. The other half of the school day was in their, quote, traditional academics, and then so the school population flip-flop, that's how we, um, you know, provided the programs. But that's exactly right. So the programs are designed, they spend four years, as I mentioned before, it operates with an with a, with a advisory council. To me, that was my responsibility as the instructor, to meet with these people to get input because that was always, you know, where, where the, the question that we had was not are they going to pass a test, but, you know, where are they going to be employed or is this the correct path to, to employment? And um, just as another point, as a successful, um, you know, thing I can point to, one of the things that's unique at our high school graduations is every year the principal announces how much uh, money that our school to work, Sue mentioned school to work, students are able to go to school to work in the second half of their junior year and spend their entire senior year out of my program in the workforce. 
And so in, in our school, there might be, I'll just take a guess, there's 150 students uh, out on a program are earning you know, over into the hundreds of thousands of dollars by the time they receive their diploma. So that's a way to um, you know, prepare and inspire, I think. The lady here is next, and then we'll go to the lady over there, and then we'll go to the gentleman in the middle. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sierra, and I'm interning at the National Association of State Boards of Education. And I had a question for all of you. Um, basically, with you all coming from uh, this uh, new background with uh, partnering with biz businesses, um, coming with this different approach, what kind of policy recommendations would you all offer, um, especially with you know us trying to reauthorize uh, you know acts that acts at this point regarding education? Everybody has their own you know uh, idea of how we should go about getting to this this race to the top. What what kind of policy policy recommendations would you all offer, uh, coming from your background and perspectives? I think in any partnership, you have to have clear goals. And the goals have to be upfront what the reason for the partnership, what the business expects to get out of it, what the school expects to get out of it, but that the business cannot take over the running of the school. That it's still public schools, if it's a partnership with a public school, that the public still, school still has to meet their standards and that it is a partnership we're helping one another not one taking over. And I agree with what Sue says in that it does have to be a team and it has to be something that the community is very supportive of because it, you're going to have to have the whole community support to make it work. And um, everyone that is a, a shareholder in that team needs to be able to have a voice on what's happening for it to be successful. Lady over, I want to, I have a question to return to this, but I'm going to hold Hi, my I'm piece. I'm Lee Jenkins, and uh, I'm an Einstein Fellow also. Um, and I teach in a very rural community in West Virginia. And my students did help write a grant. We did receive a State Farm Youth Advisory Board grant, a $41,000 grant to renovate a greenhouse on our campus. And that has been a great learning tool, but I'm wondering if you all can comment on how to attract business to rural communities where there's very little uh, industry um, and very few business partnerships. I would like to just address this in terms of uh, economic development in New York. Uh, New York is a very varied state. It's got New York City and then it's got New York State and it's got the upstate. Uh, which is very rural, and it's got a, a large agricultural uh, emphasis on that. So um, there have been partnerships in New York which have worked very well via universities, where, uh, like Cornell University, for instance, has got a big agricultural science department, which, uh, which gives training in agricultural sciences to teachers, to students, provides internships, provides curriculums, provides open uh, co-ops for the students, and then <coughs> it involves... Uh, it involves students getting graduate degrees in uh, agricultural-based uh, sciences so that they can go back to their communities. And the, one of the big drives is to retain some of the population, uh, some of the student graduate population. New York has got so many universities and graduates, some of the top graduates, but, uh, but it's a brain drain for New York. So how do we attract uh, this, uh, those people and how do you make it very, um, very very, very attractive for the students to stay back and contribute to the state. And that's one of the goals in ensuring that the agricultural uh, economic side of the agricultural sciences is sustained and entrepreneurial uh, training to students is uh, given so that when students come out from universities, maybe they have seed ideas, venture capitalists, uh, venture capital is provided for them to uh, start businesses which can s stay in the state. So that's one way that you can look at rural populations. You can look at targeted areas of development, look at what is really important for that community. So, are there any online 
partnerships that, let's say, a Cisco or an IBM or an Intel or a State Farm could be periodically mentoring your students long distance, and then perhaps at some point the mentor actually takes a trip to West Virginia so that the students would say, well, this is not just a TV show, it's a real, it's a real, I don't know if, I don't know if that exists. I know online tutoring does exist, but uh, that might be something oh. to explore. And I see that um, it is harder because I am in a more rural state. Also, that you have to have somebody first that has a dream and a vision and has to be willing to go out there and start it. And um, and then sometimes you have to go out past farther than what you would think. It can't be within just a few miles. Sometimes you have to reach out to a larger community to find someone. Um, but if you can share that that dream and that vision that you have and get them to also have that same, that sometimes that helps. I would add, Lee, too, that, that you know, Sue mentioned it's a business education partnership. So that part falls on us as educators, uh, the business community, not necessarily their mandate to be focusing on education. So that falls on our shoulders to make the needs of our students um, to the business community. So we can engage in that dialect and all across the nation. There's special circumstances and special needs in all different 50 states. So the role I see us fitting in is making, you know, we have to <clears throat> extend our hand for the partnership, and take the first step, and then, you know, that's our job to make the business community aware of our needs and create that bridge of how working together we can satisfy, you know, both objectives from the, you know, business end and from the education end. The gentleman here in the middle, and then the lady at the back, and then the gentleman even further back, and the lady up in the front. I just remember all this. <laughs> James Sang, IBM Research, retired. Um, we have a very diverse group uh, going from uh, children at risk, students at risk, to um, Intel science uh, competition types. I have two questions. One, is there uh, any su substantial difference in how um, schools relate to um, the different kinds of companies you work with, the local, small local automobile repair shop versus a MITRE or IBM research. And second, a very, very detailed question. Um, when you have internships off campus, uh, do schools ever have problems with liability? I know when we, at IBM research, when we tried bringing in high school students, we had terrible problems with the question of who carried liability if the kid got into an accident. Who would like to tackle that? conundrum <laughs> <laughs> well um, as far as uh, the liability partner question goes I think that implies that there needs to be a deeper thought in the partnership which is being uh, promoted so for a for a successful business school partnership and for successful uh, a model which has internships involved um, that needs to be specified. Partnerships will work when everything is put on the table and the school is very clear about its expectations. And the, the head of the school is involved in the, in the partnership. And the teachers are on board the student, and understand that that is something that they want for their curriculum. And, they, uh, and the students are involved and the parents are involved. So uh, it is a community effort, it's not just the one individual or one business doing it. The business has to understand where, what the school's expectations are. The school has to understand what the limitation of the business is. So when you start drafting all those partnership documents, um, you need to have that right up on the top. And those things should be very spe specific. So I think um, it seems like when you started it out, you didn't think through what, what happens, who's supposed to support the liability, sorry? We, we were doing individual student at a time. So that yes. So that's, that's, that could be a difficulty. Maybe you should have in place some policy about what, how interns will be dealt with, and that should be uh, communicated to the schools when they send their students. And I, I can chime in on the liability. Um, our school had a, and, and when I say our school, I think it's typical of many, um, have specific um, faculty that manage or managers, administrators that do manage the school to work 
program, and our school, like every other school, employ attorneys. So it's a very formal agreement. <clears throat> it actually uh, approaches a contract where both sides are negotiated, because it's not just letting a kid loose to go to work for you, but it's a prescribed educational contract. So the bottom line is you're receiving the benefits of, of the labor, but um, you, know, you understand as the host or sponsor or employer of that student that the overarching goal is that this is an educational experience for the student that may lead <coughs> to full-time employment. So it's just a, a contract like any other type of business agreement that we have. The lady all the way at the back there. And <coughs> Excuse me. Good morning. I'm, my name is Dr. Douglas. I'm with the State Board of Education for Washington, D.C. I think the, the, the incident, uh, the subject came up once before. It's kind of like overlapping. But I just want to say community involvement, like everyone has already stressed. But I think also networking is so important in our, our, uh, the community, the family, the, even, even the children's peers. That's important. Because all those services have to be wrapped around in order for everybody to be successful. Because you have to have the churches involved. You have to have the business involved. You have to have uh, uh, um, uh, parents' involvement involved. So it's kind of like uh, a unity thing, a family. Really, you're all asking to come together to support uh, our kids to make sure that uh, the children is really being um, getting all the, um, the proper uh, uh, service and material that they need to be successful. So we need to be preparing and making sure that when the business comes forth, that when we invite them out to uh, like Kmart's and Walmart's and all those other stores, that you know, ask the kids to invite them. You know, give them an opportunity to invite those uh, uh, those business to come in, so they can be able to address those issues. What are some of the things that the kids, the young men and adults, need to know what they like to see coming in to help them be successful, as well as interns. Uh, from different colleges. So I think involvement with the parents and, and also the teachers and, and the students can be very helpful to help them and uh, to get those uh, wraparound services that's needed. So we all come together as, as a family, and that's what it's all about, making sure that they be successful in, in, in achieving those, that education uh, uh, equality that uh, will make them successful in their career. So this is what I, uh, I think is so important. Supports really in a different way as much of what uh, the panel has, has said. I think that emphasizing that community commitment is, is really important, at least in so many of the, the schools I've had a chance to visit. I think there's a gentleman further back there, and then a lady here, and then this gentleman, and then the gentleman further back. I'm Tony Fowler uh, from the U.S. Department of Education. Much of this conversation tracks along the lines of the Pathways to Prosperity report. Uh, which recently came out, and I just was uh, wanted to ask the panelists if uh, they could provide their reactions to that report and whether it, uh, to the extent to which it jives with their experience. Before they answer, the this report was the Department of Education report? Harvard. Harvard? Right. And it would be on the Harvard School of Education website? Yes. I don't know enough to be able to comment. I'm embarrassed say I'll have to add that to my reading list. Uh, <laughs> could you give us a sort of maybe? Pathways to Prosperity. Basically what they're saying is that we can't expect everybody to go, go for a four-year degree. And they want to go for a four-year degree, that we need more certification for different jobs uh, throughout the country, that you don't, for a lot of uh, jobs in the economy, you don't need a four-year degree to be successful or to qualify. And so, to me, the report, because I've been working on this STEM issue for, for a decade now, the, it really is much more, to me, it's much more realistic than a lot of what we hear about people who are saying, you know, that we should, have, like the Department of Education has a goal of, you know, every, every child gets a four-year degree. And I, I think that it makes much more sense for them, for businesses to get involved to examine what they need in terms of workforce. A lot of businesses don't need people with baccalaureate degrees. Um, they need qualified technicians to have the, it, the, the right training so that they can get plugged right into the workforce, which is exactly what you guys are talking about. 
And, and I, would, I would respond to that, too, by saying <clears throat> we're fortunate in this nation to have a, a model to look to, and I would highlight NASA. You know, for 50 years, um, they have made it very clear that, um, you know, the goal of, you know, the goal before of putting a man on the moon, uh, and you see even in the recent shuttle launch, that everybody, if you've ever been around anybody that works for NASA or any facility, everybody shares in that accomplishment, not just the person that gets to go up in the shuttle. And uh, I had actually, here's a, a story that actually happened to me. I was at Stennis Space Center and in a cafeteria, and everybody's just sitting here. And the person on one side, you know, they're talking, they know each other. I thought, you know, they're friends, and I'm sitting in the middle. They asked me what I was doing there. I was there on a professional development tour, and they also hold teachers in high regard, which is unusual experience for many of us. <clears throat> But uh, the one person was um, working in uh, kind of the maintenance staff of the Stennis Space Facility, and the, the guy on the left was the person who decided where the first uh, LEM module was going to land on the moon. So I witnessed it firsthand. These are just two friends eating lunch, and it's, it's a team effort. And, and you'll, I, you know, not to highlight NASA so much, but that's one model that's at least 50 years old that if you want to look towards those things, I think they've modeled that nicely for us as, uh, as citizens of the United States. I'd like to add in, the I have not read the report, and I'm sorry that I haven't. It sounds like with the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, it's along those lines. When our town decided to build a new high school, they looked at a lot of different property. And the property they chose happened to be within half a mile, a quarter of a mile of Moraine Park Technical College, which is a two-year college for technical careers, and the two-year University of Wisconsin campus, so that it would be easy for our students to literally walk over to take courses at both of those institutions. The Career Construction Academy has a program that goes along with Moraine Park Technical College that when our students graduate in the Career Academy, they have earned dual credits, both for high school and the technical college, and they're placed in advanced standing if they decide to go into construction, knowing that it doesn't always take a four-year degree to become a good construction worker. So those were some things that the city and the community looked at when they built our new high school. Well, and I appreciate the right. fact I'm that sure, um, when you hear... Um, Department of Education and uh, the PCAST reports, they talk about college ready and career ready um, choices for students, that they're acknowledging the fact that all students are not going to go to a four-year academic college. That's a reality, but that doesn't mean all students can't come out of school and go into some kind of a program that makes them a productive citizen contributing citizen to our nation. Lady here and then the gentleman right next to her. And then we'll go back to Kimsey. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Terry Rust and I'm an Einstein fellow. And um, I have a comment for the gentleman and then a question for the panel. The, the comment with the gentleman is um, I would like to have the acknowledgement from the government, I guess, or from those who are in policy, um, that if we had a work stoppage for one day in our nation, and those who did not have a four-year degree who were important contributors to, and contributors to our economy did not work, this country would come to a complete halt. And, and there are so many jobs that we are dependent on on a daily basis to do what we need to do that don't require that college degree. And I think we are failing to recognize the importance of those in our society. Um, my comment is um, on a statement that was made earlier about CTE. Um, and I know, John, that you, that you teach at a CTE-specific campus, but I come from a school district where CTE is incorporated within our regular high schools, and I think that's a, that's a common model. Um, in, in Arizona, where I'm from, 
Uh, there is data to support that students do better on their high school exit exams and on their SAT tests having gone through the career and technical courses because of the skills, the problem solving and, and uh, higher level thinking that goes on with that. Can you address um, the importance of the 21st century skill set that is taught in the CTE courses as they relate to any student, whether they go on to a, a technical school, academia, or just out into the workforce. And, and this is open to anyone else in the panel as well. I, can, I don't think it's limited just to career technical courses. I think the 21st century skills should be taught at all levels in every class so that students are prepared once they leave the secondary schools for whatever field they go into. The idea of being able to be problem solvers, critical thinkers, being able to communicate is an important skill that all students should have, not just those who are in career programs. I had an, an experience in uh, Burlington County where I <clears throat> taught with the community college, actually received an NSF grant, and there's a Lockheed uh, Martin um, large facility right in Burlington County. So they engaged in a two-year study just to address those issues and uh, make a long story short, uh, after a lot of investigations and subgroup reportings, you know, basically the, the college was saying, what do you want from us? And it came down to 21st century learning skills. So, you know, I love going to those type of meetings because just as you, Terry, you know, that, that's just ingrained in what we do. When 21st century learning um, skills came out, um, that's where CTE, I think, stepped up because as other people were like, what are you talking about? How are we going to infuse this in the curriculum? We're already doing that because industry came back and Lockheed Martin came back and said, we would prefer that you address these skills uh, oh, don't worry about the content. We know how to teach our content. We know what our engineers want to do. And, and by the way, that might change by next year. So don't even waste your time. You can give them some fundamentals. So you have to look at all those factors coming in, the, you know, the quickening pace of uh, technology. You know, by the time the kids get out of four years of high school, it already changed anyhow. So you have to kind of focus on the, the key concepts. But where, you know, then you get into society issues. So they're looking for you know people to get along and not make fun of each other be able to work in groups you know kind of move them out of the high school area where they're adolescents and transition them into how to, how you know what's acceptable behavior in the business community that was Lockheed Martin's uh, biggest objection so um, yeah i think that you know that that just I think the, the academic world is going to come. So I'll, I'll put a prediction out on the table right now. After all, dust settles, I'll bet you the nation ends up with a CTE model. That'll be, I'll, I'll go out on the limb and say that. <laughs> I, I just want to make one statement. I'm sorry, did you? No, go ahead. OK. Um, that, first of all, the whole involvement of the business in ed education was because the businesses have, an, have a product in mind. The reason that the businesses started investing so much in education, and this is not new, they have been doing it for the last 30 years. Um, after 10, after I think 20, 25 years back was when the, the uh, I think it was Institute of Competitive, Co Competitive Council or whatever, I, I forget the exact name, but it came out with the Nation at Risk report. And the Nation at Risk report underlined the fact that we have such a, large uh, drop in graduation rates and that the graduates who are coming out are not uh, coming with the skills required for their workforce and the businesses realize that it is really hurting their workforce development. So they needed to graduates who needed who had the skills that they were looking for and we are in the 21st century, the businesses need 21st century skills. So the whole notion of the business involvement in the education came about because they're so keen on having a workforce available for them in their own country and instead of importing from outside. So I think that's important whether you talk about CTE or you talk about traditional schools or you talk about schools which develop, uh, give certificates and diplomas and academies, academic schools which allow students to go right into the job after, after the high school diplomas. I think it goes back again to where I'm working with at-risk kids. These are kids who would be high school dropouts and there's, um, 
I can't tell you the exact numbers, but there's a large percentage of students that are still dropping out of high school. They're not even graduating from high school, let alone going on to careers and college. Um, that when communities and businesses and, univers and universities also get involved with the education of students, yes, we do gain a better prepared workforce. We have students that are better uh, ready to go out into the work world, and that's what the businesses are gaining from that, but we also gain as the schools, when they become involved and students are engaged, they stay in school. Our graduation rate from my school of having students that would probably been I won't say 100% dropouts, because some of them may have somehow struggled and figured out how to do it. But we now have over 70% of those students graduating from high school. So that 70% of however many students go through my school year, which is, I don't know, 700 probably, um, kids that are ready now to look at doing something else in their lives. And so the, it's a full circle. Everybody wins when everybody gets involved and gets concerned about our students. And it's not just someone else's problem, it's our problem. And we can solve it together. Gentleman right here is next. And then back to Kimsey. I'm Steve, teacher from Washington State. I'm curious about the ways that you think we might be able to change the perception of career and technical education among the nation's guidance counselors. So often it seems that when a kid says they're interested in college, they're directed towards honors and AP classes that virtually ensure they won't have an experience that applies to real world business. So in your experience, what can we do to change that? We have one program in our school district and it's been in place for probably as long as I've been there and longer. It's business and industry and education and the counselors specifically are encouraged to go. It's one night a year, and different companies in Fond du Lac open up their doors and show people in education what the businesses are all about and that these are the skills the students need to come and work for us. And they try to get the message out loud and clear that you always don't need those AP classes, but they really do target the counselors to come to those programs. Arun Dottie, I remember once in a conversation with you about having your students build a rocket. I was a little, sorry, I was a little intimidated by it, I must say, but did you, is there a sense that project-based learning might uh, not substitute for, but have some of the same elements as the CTE experience? Uh, definitely. I think that I was just going to respond to Steve and say that uh, we don't really need a CTE kind of a course in place to tell them that it's important, but we need, in fact, the way I attract students into my physics courses is to offer them projects which will allow them to use skills, uh, build up their technical skills and uh, uh, building skills and skills like using AutoCAD, for instance, using uh, simulation model software to uh, to produce a product which then they can go out and build. These are the skills that they can learn in high school. So I use those kind of uh, programs to attract them into higher level courses. So I think there are some trade-offs uh, in CTE education for offering uh, high level <laughs> physics courses. So how do you attract them into the classrooms like project-based learnings where I had the students develop a rocket, participate in the Team America Rocketry Challenge, which is supported by the aerospace industries, where they had to build it through the software, understand the software, and then go and watch videos <coughs> and learn how to use tools. And I'm talking about girls, and this is a private girls' school. They're not used to dealing with tools. They're not used to working with their hands. But they spend hours in their um, winter vacations sitting down and trying to build that rocket, and they get so thoroughly engaged in that. So I think that model is um, very uh, inducive to learning. And I would say maybe we need to look a little bit at how we um, <coughs> build our upper level AP type courses. And maybe some of those courses need to be some 
room in them for students to do some of these same kind of project based type thing. Uh, Kimsey? Just two things as a small point of uh, information that there is an online way for teachers and students to connect with businesses, albeit not as widespread as I would like, but National Lab Network does exist and does have partners with over 200 professional societies, business industry, and one of the easiest ways that teachers and students can connect through that is through the simple act of science fair. So, you know, you do a science fair project, you could really beef up that project by getting kids to partner with a local engineer or a local business um, and make the science fair project not be just, you know, growing radish seeds, but really something that an, an industry or business would really be interested in. And I would encourage anybody who's in the Washington, D.C. area who's listening to this or who is paying attention to this on the web webcast that the D.C. Science and Engineering Festival is short, about 150 judges. And they got a great business sponsorship through the Washington Wizards, and it's going to be held at the Verizon Center on April 1st. And you can Google D.C. SEF, and you could get involved. There's over 600 kids in the D.C. area who have already got projects ready to go, but they need judges, and that's one way to get businesses involved in schools. That's a point of information. And then just a comment to go back on what Steve was saying and what um, Tony, I think it was saying, is that I think that we have to be really careful about issues about tracking um, when you start talking about offering, you know, multiple pathways. Because for me, as a, as a freshman teacher, I teach freshmen, and I know that a lot of my kids coming in the door would easily choose the path of least resistance, which might mean fewer high-level courses, more like work style work, which I think is valuable. But then by the time they finish my algebra course and they get into some of the higher level mathematics, they get so turned on in an academic sense that if they would have been taken away from that environment, then I worry that they wouldn't ever go to pursue you know, higher level mathematics or higher level physics or things like that. So I just think that we need to be careful about how we choose our pathways and make sure that like what Brenda said, which is that there would be room for both, that you could wiggle through and you could build a platform for yourself as a student as you grow and mature, not necessarily making a decision at the age of 14 when you walk in the door to high school, yes, I want to go full throttle CTE or yes, I want to go full throttle this way. I think that the blended idea of what John was saying where they spend time with him and then also have all the regular requirements, I think that's a much better model in my mind in terms of protecting kids from making decisions at the very young and immature age of 14 years old. Well, well, could I, please, please, John. I'd like to we'll respond to that right too. So Kamsey uh, uh, very eloquently um, expressed a major misconception of CTE. So it's not really um, the, do they have to make that choice. So if you look at um, some of the programs, for instance, over the four years, my students in my particular program were engaged in environmental science, oceanography, atmospheric science, and GIS. <clears throat> All on actually were more, higher academic requirements than some of the academic portion. Um, and then how that works, and again, to promote CTE, when my students graduated in four years, they had, in four years, they not only received a high school diploma, but they had up to 12 advanced credits at the local community college with a, with a um, school to school partnership, again, with, uh, just like with industry. So th this is part of that advisory board that I spoke about before. So the, the one of the hats that, uh, that I, that I have to wear often is this, is, you know, getting the public perception to say, you know, CTE or vocational education in the old mindset is not what it used to be. You know, this is the 21st century, and you look at the offerings of the schools, you know, we have pre-engineering, veterinary assistant, CAD, highly academic, and in fact, the schools are switching to where the academic teachers are supporting the careers. And that gives that more holistic approach to the students at the young age, as you mentioned, get the idea that, you know, and again, go back to that question that I'm sure you've heard, Kamsi, is, well, I have to learn algebra. So when you're in that situation, when the pre-engineering teaching starts out and he's starting to teach them calculus, 
you know, he's, he's beating on them right away about, well, you need to like jump through these algebra classes quick because we have more sophisticated things to do. So it, it's, it's burning the candles at both, at both ends. And, and I'll just take a second, too, to respond to Steve that what we need to do is, you, you know, you just need to wear that hat. You know, I had in my school educate my administration and the guidance counselors of what STEM education was. When that started rolling up, they're busy doing other things like running the school. And they didn't know what that was. And they're used to, you know, marching along the beat. So you have to stop. Hey, are you aware of this? Point them to some resources, you know, talk their ear off at lunchtime. And that's just part of where we are. But that is a... Um, a really important part and here's another thing I'll throw out for you too for the teachers in the room to consider my students chose to come into my program so I say this to teachers how many kids would you have in your class if they were completely free to get up and walk out the door right now so that puts a different perspective on the instruction Ralph Regula uh, three questions one are there any of you with experience of charter schools being organized around the concept of industry education partnerships? Secondly, do the state certification requirements for teachers inhibit the ability of bringing people from industry into the education environment? And thirdly, do any of the professional groups such as the NEA write up your programs uh, in their publications so that other schools would be inspired to, to uh, uh, emulate what you're doing in your school. I think uh, it's important that the message can be put out, and I don't know whether the groups like NEA uh, put these things in their publications. I can address the charter school since our school district is in the process of setting up a 3-5 STEM charter school. And the people behind it is Mercury Marine Industry. Right now in their workforce, they have a 3 to 1 ratio. Three people are retiring and they only see one coming into the pipeline. So they see a need that they need to have people coming in. And they're trying to grow the city so that people who are in the city will stay in the city. And that's one of the driving forces behind them wanting the STEM charter school. It's starting out at 3-5 because there's a lot of research that shows if you don't catch kids before the age of grade 5 in the areas of science, they'll never go into science. There are plans to expand the charter school to 6-8 the following year and then to 9-12 the year thereafter. But they want to have students who have a solid background in STEM to go into science, technology, engineering, and math fields when they leave the charter school. The gentleman over here. I just want oh, I'm sorry, to, I cut you all uh, off. Please listen. Uh, no, I wanted to respond to the other two questions um, uh, asked. Uh, that's regarding the state certification inhibiting teachers, uh, alternate part teachers. I'm an alternate part teacher. And I know that in uh, Einstein Fellows, uh, we have a bunch of us who came the alternate route. So it did not really inhibit uh, me to go into teaching. Uh, but I would say that the certification requirements for the Fairfax County did kind of put me off into going into the public school system because uh, my application first went to the human resources before it went to anybody else. And if they don't see a praxis score on my application, they were not willing to look at my other qualifications. So what, it was, what was the score. The praxis. Praxis. Score. The praxis. Okay. That was what I was told by the human resources that they need to see a praxis score on me or an intention to take that exam. And I was just uh, surprised because most of the time the teacher shortage is in physics chemistry and mathematics and I had all three uh, I had I have graduate credits in all three subjects and I just did not see what was the problem in giving me a chance to go uh, into the alternate certification route which uh, so it was kind of hard to get in there um, so yes in a way it does but at the same time I know that there are uh, alternate teachers who have gone the alternate routes and there are some schools which some school systems which welcome the alternate path and then uh, you asked about um, 
teachers writing up in um, NEA and other organizations where um, good projects are uh, given more publicity. NSTA does that all the time. NSTA uh, invites science teachers uh, to write articles. And there are other organizations uh, which support the teachers, like um, mathematics teachers and the technical and uh, engineering education teachers, to submit articles. Uh, where they've shown um, excellent uh, educational practices. And in fact, the AAPT, which is the American Association of Physics Teachers, produces a wonderful uh, journal which is real life uh, teacher experiences in the classroom and how they can be modeled in and taken to scale by other teachers. I agree, though, that there is some uh, resistance in some places f to let that um, career change for teachers to easily be able to move from a business or scientific career into the schools. Um, I've seen that in my, where I come from. It's, I think the mindset is changing as the need is getting greater for well-qualified, well-educated people, but it's, um, there's been some resistance. Let's go to this gentleman over here. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Bartlett, and I work at the Boeing Company. And there's been a lot of conversation about um, students going out into industry and bringing the academic environment um, out into, into industry. I'm curious about your thoughts on the role of industry coming into the schools, mm -hmm. specifically through the form of mentors, tutors, um, or any kind of advisors towards student-based projects or learning-based projects, um, and just any comments you would have on that. Um, I have here with me an article from Education Week, which actually talks about a Boeing Mesa partnership. Um, I'm sure you're aware of that. Did you arrange this? Uh, <laughs> 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 and I, I'm going to read it out, sure. some, some lines here. Um, and it says, in the Boeing Mesa partnership, the company first helped the district set up a helicopter flight simulator in 1997 proposed and designed by retired Boeing engineers and a fifth grade curriculum that for six weeks teaches science and math through aviation themes and pilot skills. The company built a second simulator in 2000, so all 4,000 fifth grade graders in the district could participate. And in 2005, uh, Boeing helped the district revamp a space simulation program for sixth graders by replacing an old parent build plywood space shuttle with a steel mock-up also designed by the retired engineers and equipped with wireless computers. The, compu the company also paid for training teachers in how to use the craft effectively. The partners are now building a second shuttle simulator. So, uh, so yes, Boeing does it, uh, but so do a lot of companies. Uh, uh, and, and like I said, the business has a vested interest in, in the schools because they're looking at them as their workforce. And um, it is challenging considering that um, the American workforce is changing. And they say that uh, in, the, in a decade, only 15% of the new entrants to the labor force will be native white males compared to 47% today. So there's an, an, there's an emphasis on ensuring that the minority population be educated. And um, most of these areas are low-income areas and high-need areas. This is where business needs to go and invest if they need to ensure that they have a well-educated workforce. Well, and I wanted to say that research has shown, and common sense tells you also, that um, if you want to reach out and change the life of a child, no matter what their circumstances they're in, they need to have at least one significant adult in their life. And a mentor could be that one significant person. A lot of uh, students out there come from single parent families. Um, they don't have role models. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. I can give some quick examples. My husband used to teach <coughs> physics. And he asked the state patrol to send in their reconstructionist into the classroom. The reconstructionist came in and explained how they use physics to help solve when there's been a crash. He also brought in the city police department and they brought in their speed guns and they used to go out on the streets and let the students use the speed guns to clock the speed of the cars as they're going back to help talk about acceleration and velocity. It's all physics to me, I don't. 
know the exact <laughs> terms, but it was bringing local businesses in to help the students. A third example is not going directly into the classroom, but working with teachers. In the Career Construction Academy, the Mat it's called the Association of General Contractors out of Madison, Wisconsin, is now training the math and language arts teachers who are teaching that program at no cost to our district so that they understand what the business world is in those areas. And, and I'll add, I can think kill three birds with one stone here. Uh, one uh, current project that another um, one of the Einstein fellows, Kevin Simmons, and I are working on is this CubeSat project. So we are very, there are small satellites that go in space, just to keep you up to date there. <coughs> you, um, As if you think I wouldn't be up. Well, just covering my bases here. Um, but we're, we're very engaged with the private aerospace industry because it's the same thing. It builds into that uh, pipeline. So we're looking in the area and working with uh, NASA and all these other uh, places to get a hands-on technology that students can experience. So, yeah, we welcome. That's basically the model that CAMSI's work is with the National Lab Network is making those connections. So I'm doing... Um, projects back with my school and a couple of the faculty members there and then to go back to the congressman's question um, just by happenstance that the New Jersey uh, Education Association produces a program that's um, uh, shown on the New Jersey network called Classroom Close-Up that focuses on on teachers and students and projects, a lot of project base, and that's from New Jersey, Walter Wilson's home state, right? And uh, by chance, if you Google that, there's actually a story on me and the CubeSats um, this week, right now. So if you Google Classroom Close-Up, uh, New Jersey, and look down, the program's called Zero G, and you can see a good example of that happening. The gentleman there at the back. Hi, I'm Frank Gallagher, and I'm with the Cable Industries Education Foundation, Cable in the Classroom. Now, you've talked about um, teachers from business and science uh, worlds coming alternate certification into schools. You've talked about giving, um, having businesses come in for a class or a session. You talked about giving kids internships in businesses and other uh, Places, but what's the importance in a business partnership of giving educators a chance to work in business, say, over the summer as an intern? <laughs> <laughs> I know who wants that. <laughs> I've done an experience through the National Science Foundation called Research Experiences for Teachers for six summers, where I was in labs at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Going in and learning the process of science is not something that we can do when we're going through our college coursework. You don't get to step into a lab and actually experience real research. Being able to take that experience back into my classroom, I feel that my students have a better understanding of the process of science now than before I had those, because I got to experience it myself. Um, there's a lot of businesses. Amico hires teachers in the summer to work in their labs. DuPont brings teachers in during the summer to be research assistants. To have those experiences, you can go back and then tell your students and maybe hopefully design activities to help them learn what's actually happening in those businesses, to get them excited, to inspire, and let them find out what's really happening. I think there'd be a lot more teachers that would be interested in that if they knew about programs that were out there. And they probably don't know that there are businesses or industry that were interested in going that direction. The DOE Act has got a program which also places uh, teachers in the laboratories. And it's been, I know, it had, let's say, let me say it, it had, which is wonderful, but it's one of those things. I wanted to jump back with a, a couple of questions I've been noting here. First, uh, Ralph Regula's question in a sense about how do you spread uh, best practices or successful practices that may or may not be adapted to another school. I wondered if the perhaps the Department of Education might play that role and have a online menu that one could look at. So if you're from, say, a smaller rural school in Idaho or West Virginia, that one sort of experiment might be appropriate or 
there might be something that's generic like building a rocket that would cite, excite everyone and to have that whole menu that's that's available that you could simply search and see gee this school sounds like mine it's about the same size and a similar kind of community I wonder if we couldn't try X Y or Z and that would be a uh, a fairly low cost thing I think for the, well, here I'm giving the Department of Education more work, but us above our pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but let's say if there were an amendment to the uh, ESEA or the No Child Left Behind law to uh, give the Department of, uh, of Education that opportunity. But I, I want to spring and say the teach.gov, which the ed has started, the new website, I believe it has, uh, the intention of that website is to, um, to attract new teachers and to provide them resources and point out links and other uh, places where they can go and get this kind of information. So There have been a lot of discussions about expanding the scope of, of the subject areas of teach.gov, and it's a... Basically, teach.gov was established for teaching jobs, uh, but I think that there's a lot of potential there. Uh, that we also have a federal resources in, in, uh, for excellence in education, the free website, which is free.gov.ed.gov, is that right? Yeah. And um, that has a lot of information about projects that federal agencies have partnered, some, some of which federal agencies have partnered with schools uh, on every subject imaginable. So there is some material out there. Um, but we've, I think that there have been a whole lot of different suggestions that have been made about expanding the scope of what teach.gov can do. And I think that they're just being very careful about reaching out beyond its intended purpose at this point. And then we have, well, why don't you mention it because I don't know about it. Do <laughs> <laughs> you want to make a comment there about the bridge? Um, the, re the Department of Ed funds regional education laboratories and each one has their own specialty area. And if you go to the website, you can Google the regional labs and get into the Department of Ed main web page for them and they have best practices pages that are up there that you can search individually for each of the 10 labs and I you used I haven't done it for a couple of years but you used to be able to do it from the Department of Ed website to put in a topic and it would pull from all of the different best practices websites also the old Marco Polo website which was started by I think MCI and has been picked up by the Verizon Foundation and others to support it has a really good database of lesson plans, materials, as well as um, entire programs that you can oh, see the outlines okay. for. I'd Infinity, like, yeah. I'd also like to plug in for some of the places that we have been as Einstein Fellows, the USA Today and NBC Learn. All these um, media offer uh, their own background material for educational purposes. For instance, NBC Learn has got all these cool sports shots which then map on to curriculum in teaching uh, how to learn physics. So, and those are all available. They're not all free. Um, some of them do need uh, some fee to be, um, to sign on and get, but I think they get one month trial and then you can do it and maybe that could be something which businesses could partner with to give to schools so that teachers can have a look and use those kind of uh, practices in their classroom. I think also you, that I can't, excuse me, that um, I've heard Secretary Duncan at least a couple times in my small circle talk about pockets of excellence, you know, way back from last year and uh, I assume that that's what uh, he's talking about when uh, when I listen to him talk about that. And that's, a, and that's the thing is, you know, around this country, it's not all doomsday. We have to get off the doomsday train here. Um, some of the fellows last year, you might remember, taught in really high-need school districts that people write off. But these are excellent teachers who became Einstein fellows, so they must be doing something right, that are in some of the nation's worst schools. So it's not, not all bad all the time. That has to do with the perception of teaching and then the other thing is with the under the secretary's idea of pockets of excellence there's a lot of things going on and 
You know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you should do everything the way I do. What I do works for me with the students. My only concern is the students that I teach. I know them very well, and I want to get them from point A to point B. And so I have to make individual decisions based on those people that are entrusted to me for four years in my face for, you know, seven hours a day. Examples here, you know, our fellow fellow Steve does really in my mind, unbelievable work. It's very, you know, not non-traditional is the best, you know, the simple term to explain it. So the point is not everybody's going to be able to do what Steve does and gives those kids experiences. But as a nation, you don't want to put any roadblocks in his way. You know, I work to, to my last breath to take down roadblocks, you know, for him to, to go forward with what he does. And there could be 100 people in the room saying he's out of his mind. In fact, I'm sure he's probably been told that more than one time. But that doesn't stop him. And he's meeting needs of a very spe specific uh, type of students and being successful, of meeting them where they are and engaging the students in the learning. The one thing that you hardly ever hear around, and no matter where you're going, talking about education is, has anybody ever talked to the kids? So you've talked to researchers, you've talked to policymakers, you talk to teachers, but even teachers, I challenge them, have you ever spoken to the kids that you teach? Guess what? They'll, they'll believe me. Um, they'll tell you what they think. It's not all negative. And somewhere way back in, the, in this program, they were, you were talking about um, you know, making choices. And I always gave my students the opportunity um, as we started as freshmen. I said, you know, here's what the school's expecting from you. Here's what business is going to expect from you. And here's what I'm going to expect from you. But that's just my point of view. I'll teach you on any three levels because I can do that. I can make the choice. And I always, this, this was always the test question. So how do you want me to proceed from the first day of school? And in 29 years, every single freshman class that I had said, give it to us with both barrels. They don't want the easy way out. And these are not the MIT students. These are kids that are coming to school that may be first year, I mean, first people in their family that are going to go on to higher education. They're not even sure about it. The students are coming at age 14 with those goals, and the parents are working against that. The reason the parents are sending them out to that school is to get a career and go to work. They don't want to hear about this college nonsense. So there's all a sticky spider web out there of you know, when you deal with kids are human beings, and every single one of us are different. So it's about look at all the options. Question is, how do you organize them? Well, we'll throw that over the leak and work on that over there at the Department of Aid. But, but then as teachers, we spend a large portion of our life looking for those opportunities. So that's really something that could streamline the younger people coming along. The question I get is, you know, how do you get to do what you do? And then I have to say, well, I stayed after school every day for two and a half hours looking for things. And some people don't want to do that. Some people cannot do that. But there are, you know, tons of opportunities. The question is, where's the clearinghouse to get to them most efficiently and quickly? Lady right here. Hi, I'm a t uh, Tina King, also an Einstein Fellow. But one of my concerns is that, you know, even if you had the clearinghouse, you know, how do you know people will come? And it's not because they don't want to come. A lot of times they don't know. Because even as a very active teacher, we're just learning about some of the resources that have and best practices that have been out there. So I think the biggest concern is if you have a place for people to go, teachers, parents, uh, practitioners to go, how do you get the word out to them um, you know, that it is available? Good question. What do you think? Agencies do a good job, though. NOAA has a wonderful education website. NASA has a wonderful ve education website. Most of the times when I've had um, questions and I needed some help with some new lessons and wanted models, I would just Google them out. And I think Google has become such a powerful tool that I don't think we need uh, a clearinghouse. We get, we get, and then we have these pet websites that we keep revisiting. So there definitely is. It goes back to it goes back to John's statement, which says the teacher has to be interested in ensuring that innovative practices come into the classroom. It is an investment of the teacher's time. But did you know it's like knowing about USA Today and AIP and all of these things that are out there? Even when you do invest the time in it, uh, there is so much, 
And I think it's a concern of a lot of them, and they keep asking us about it. How do you get this out? How do you disseminate this to where the teachers uh, know? And it, I think mm -hmm. it is a concern with them on this. Could you have a, a one-page set of, of sites that uh, there's so many national organizations in Washington uh, from legislators to school superintendents to different professional societies that there ought to be a way to online distribute this to every school and they print it out and put it in everybody's box and then you've got it easily uh, I don't know this is there's one problem with that though you need money to get it started yeah. and yeah. Um, NSTA had partnered with ExxonMobil, a large business, and they had put into um, practice a program called Building a Presence. And what they tried to do is get one teacher in every single school across the United States to be a go-to person who could get the information that was coordinated by a state coordinator out to everybody in their schools. The program changed, transformed in the last couple of years. Some states still have the program in place. In Wisconsin, it's morphed into what's called the Wisconsin Science News Network. And those people who were part of building a presence, and we have about 8,000 teachers online, every week get a newsletter by the state coordinator that just has six things to let us know about some of the partnerships going on in the state, some of the businesses what Promega is doing for teachers in the summer, but it's just this little news. But it had to take money to get that started, and right now it's being done without any funding. Well, we're really very close to our, our witching hour. Maybe there's one very last question over there. I'm going to have a couple announcements. Thank you. My name is Monica Bibbs Taylor. I'm from DC Public Schools, curriculum specialist. Um, and hearing all the discussion, I would like your take, the panel guest, on the Common Core standards, um, in particular those standards that are addressing the STEM issue and the integrated and the traditional pathways. Do you feel that those pathways will assist with preparation for career readiness since they were devised also for college? But I would like your take on that. Is um, those states that adopted it, are we going in the right direction? I'd like to go back to my Nation at Risk report. Thirty years back, the whole reason why business started investing in education was because they felt that they were getting a product which was not made to their prescription, and they realized that in spite of their investing money, et cetera, in the schools, they were not really coming up, and they then started the movement for ensuring some kind of st standards, and um, one of the big uh, nonprofit education organizations is Achieve, um, which has got a lot of subsequent uh, nonprofit organizations which also talk about uh, ensuring that there is some kind of standards uh, and it is non-governmental and it is participatory by states, uh, voluntary participation. So, uh, so I think uh, the businesses do understand the need for standards and uh, again some of those things do drive the businesses to invest in education. Well, we've really almost reached our witching hour, and I just wanted to make uh, a couple announcements. Uh, first of all, on your way out, you will see two publications, one of which is about the 20th anniversary conference celebrating the Einstein Fellows and what they've done over the 20 years. And it includes a very, I thought, thought-provoking discussion of what might be done on education going forward, and it includes a set of specific recommendations that the Einstein Fellows then used in their visits up on Capitol Hill. Uh, the second is this afternoon, for those of you who all here with that passion for education, we're doing a book discussion on a book called The New Cool. And the author has tracked a FIRST Robotics team, which is very much another example of project, potentially project-based learning, track the team from the day it gets the announcement about the game the robot's going to play and the kit of parts and how they design it and it does capture the excitement of the students and really how it affects their thinking about their own future. Uh, it is a team that does get to the championship and almost makes it to the very final stage and uh, Arundhati will be pleased to know that the the teacher mentor who is such a driving force is a physics teacher. So. 
the, uh, the final thing I would just uh, like to say is to, to thank you very much for coming. Thank Ralph Regula for joining us this morning. And would you please join me in a round of applause for an outstanding panel. Thank you all. Thank you.